No, let's do it. Thanks, everybody, for coming. My name is Chris Bavitz. I'm one of the faculty co-directors at the Berkman Center for Internet and Society, which is a, a university-wide research center here at Harvard, as some of you may know. We have an, an amazing crowd in the room today, an incredible panel. I just want to make a couple of really quick announcements up front before we get going. In addition to the folks who are physically here, we have people joining us online. Hello, Internet. And uh, we mentioned that we are live streaming and recording in case you stand up and ask a question, which we hope you will do. Just be aware that will be preserved for posterity. And um, I also just want to extend a special announcement to those folks who are here because of Hub Week um, in the Boston area. You may or may not know that the Berkman Center has hosted these events Tuesday at noon of various sizes and scales for over a decade at this point. So pretty much every Tuesday at 12, if you go to the Berkman Center website, both live here at Harvard and then uh, live streamed on the internet, we have a pretty wide variety of folks who are interested in technology, media, people from the academic communities, business, law, policy. It's a great program put together by people like Amr Asher and, and Carrie Anderson and Dan Jones at Berkman. And um, I encourage you to follow up after today and check that out. Um, next week for that event, we have Corey Doctorow here, who's going to be talking to Jonathan Zetrain. And the week after that, we have a presentation um, from a Berkman fellow, Patrick Merck, about Bitcoin and digital currency. Um, so uh, we are here today to talk about a subject that's near and dear to the hearts of a lot of people at the Berkman Center. Um, a lot of folks at Berkman think about how and why people make and distribute creative content online. And if we go back a decade or so, we had people at the center, including people like Christopher Lydon and Benjamin Walker and Jake Shapiro, who were addressing those issues specifically in the context of audio content and really played a key role in the creation and development of podcasting as a medium. And as we have been looking at the headlines in the last year or two about this sort of renaissance, this wave of popularity in podcasting programs like Serial and Mark Marin hosting President Obama in his garage for the WTF podcast, we thought Hub Week gave us a great opportunity here to bring a group together and kind of look back. Um, I'm going to give four really quick introductions, and then I'm going to turn it over to Christopher to talk a little bit about um, his earliest experiences here. Christopher Lydon, former journalist with the New York Times, anchored the 10 o'clock news on WGBH here in Boston, and in 1994 became host of The Connection on WBUR. He's currently the host of Radio Open Source on WBUR in Boston. Um, next to him is Kerry Hoffman. Kerry and Jake Shapiro, next to Kerry, are both with PRX, the Public Radio Exchange. Uh, which is located right down the block here in Harvard Square. PRX is an award-winning nonprofit whose mission is to deliver significant stories to millions of people. Since it was launched in 2003, it's been an innovator in public media, and its programs include the Moth Radio Hour, This American Life, Snap Judgment, and Reveal. PRX also relatively recently launched the Radiotopia Podcast Network, which includes programs like Benjamin Walker's Theory of Everything, Roman Mars' 99% Invisible, and uh, Song Exploder. And last but not least, at the end, Benjamin Walker also has Berkman connections from back in uh, 2005, where he worked at Berkman on projects like Global Voices and with Berkman Center founder Charlie Nesson on a wide range of audio and multimedia projects. He's hosted the Too Much Information show at WFMU in New Jersey and then the Theory of Everything podcast. Um, Christopher, I'm going to ask if you could just orient us and maybe talk a little bit about sort of the early, uh, the early days here. Uh, delighted, Chris. And... Um Thank you for being here. Thank you for setting the pace with a lot of fast talk there, too. <laughs> um, uh, on, my, on our website, Radio Open Source, you can still find something I attached, a little short essay about the first, that accompanied the, the first podcast, which was a conversation with Dave Weiner. And I thought it's a way to begin. Uh, I, I identified myself as a journalist, an all-purpose searcher, not at all a techie, but very much fascinated with blogging in, in the trend storm of media. Blogging being the, 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 the first run of the podcast phenomenon. But I said, blog world has the crackle and pop that traditional media conspicuously do not these days. It's cheap and easy at entry. It's politically free, wildly opinionated, but also information rich. It's literary, it's musical, it's poetic. It has the full range of human curiosity and passion about it. A lot of it is funny, feminist, futurist, cosmopolitan, confident, and all those other good, buzzy things like edgy, enthusiastic, highly energized. The adrenal elite is here, said I, about Blog World. <laughs> and it's, it's here again today in this room. That's the most important thing. I mean, we could talk about so many things, including what a pleasure it is to 
work on your own with a brilliant staff, a uh, friendly audience, some still in broadcasting in some degree, but out in podcast world. I mean, it is everything like I, I could have hoped for when I you know, went into journalism in the first place. We can also talk about problems. We can also talk, I hope, about the history of the thing. For me, the history of the blog and digital journalism is inseparable from the war in Iraq. I mean, I wrote this in July 2003. Dave Weiner and I started trying to dope out what a podcast would look like. I mean, I met Dave Weiner here. He said, you know radio, I know, you know programming. What the world needs is an MP3 that can be syndicated. I said, what's an MP3? Anyway, uh, we worked on it. Finally, we hatched it. He said, I think we've got it. I said, now what do we do? He said, well, it's obvious. You're going to interview me, and we're going to put it out on, on the web. <laughs> so anyway, all that time was the beginning of the war in Iraq against uh, a total blank of public conversation. Not one journalistic institution that you can name opposed the war in Iraq. The elite was totally asleep or out to lunch or corrupted. And to me, the whole point of the thing, it was not a technical trick, it was not a commercial opportunity, it was a way to explore the possibility of restoring a public conversation in this country. You look at the public conversation today and you say, what the hell have we done? Why has it just gone into the toilet and stayed there? And to me, that is still the riddle. For me, just for starters, and I'll get off in a moment, Mark Maron talking to the president is much more interesting than almost the, the, the other kinds of stuff that's now blooming commercially on the web. Or, for that matter, David Axelrod talking to Bernie Sanders. I mean, this is the sort of conversation that... Um, uh, well, it's, it's what we need, and it's what the blog world did start to restore in 2003. At the BloggerCon, Charlie Nesson and Dave Weiner pulled together an important event, um, but we needed it again. The one thing we didn't have in those days was investors. Uh, I think, obviously, the world has gotten incredibly hot commercially for this medium, which is in many ways to be celebrated, but as we get into it, I, I, I will also say I think it's something very much to be aware of. That's my short form. Look back, look forward. Terrific. That's great. That's Thank, you. <laughs> Thank you. Benjamin, maybe I'll reach down to the other end of the, of the aisle for you. Talk a little bit about your, your beginnings and your earliest experiences with this as a medium. What, sure, what sure. excited you about it? It's, it's so good to hear Chris again on all of this. <laughs> but um, it was here. Um, Mary McGrath, who's sitting over there in the audience, uh, Chris Lydon's producer, um, other half of Radio Open Source. Um, I mean, it was like 11 years ago, like this week, it was October 2004, I, had, I was doing an hour-long radio show as one of the side things I was working on here on WZBC here in Boston, and my friend Roman Mars was doing an hour show on KLW in San Francisco, and we came up with this plan that if we made our shows a half hour each, we could like be on both coasts. That was like our innovation in, at that moment. And then Mary McGrath calls me and she says, you know, you better make your show a podcast or you're just going to be the biggest loser ever. And I didn't, I just, I knew that Chris and Dave Weiner were doing all this weird stuff with this MP3 and RSS, but I, I just, I wasn't really paying attention until Mary ordered me to and I sat down and I looked this up. All of these links are gone. Like you have to use the Internet Archive for all of it except the Engadget post that has like the how to podcast from um, October 2004. And it was off to the races. And it's, I was thinking about how one year later from then in 2005, I was getting all these jobs as podcast consultants. I remember all those, Jake? It was ridiculous. <laughs> and now like how that year excitement has almost been like this year post-serial. You know, it's sort of been another a lot of hype. And I'm wondering, yeah, I, I see a lot of parallels and, I, and it makes me fear the one that, sort of the crash that happened after that. Because, you know, there was a lot of excitement about podcasting starting from 2004 to 2006. And then there was the dead time. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, I'm, you know, it could, you know, who's to say that couldn't happen again? We have so many podcasts getting so excited about all of the advertising that's come Right our way. I mean, they, there are money trucks literally dumping money on us right now. It's kind of crazy. But how many content businesses Speaking have not, about you know, had that money disappear overnight? Overnight. And I feel that, you know, as, as everyone's trying to, you know, party and have a good time and figure out what's next, I do sometimes think that maybe we should be still thinking about what's next. That's my little short wrap. 
Jake, I've heard you talk about sort of the waves of, of, of uh, creative energy in this space. Can you kind of start where these guys have started, maybe bring it up to, up to date a little bit? Sure. Um, it's kind of amazing because actually all of us were around in that uh, moment, um, Carrie and I too, because PRX was uh, launched in the fall of 2003. I had been at Berkman and um, watching this like technology take shape, the RSS with enclosures seemed like a really silly, uh, trivial thing at the moment, and then suddenly uh, caught on in a way that surprised us all. And I remember you know, Dave Weiner, um, as he's wont to do, uh, beating me up pretty badly about why we had this crazy idea of like taking those same beautiful audio files and like just delivering to these local stations for broadcast when we could w tear the cover off and uh, push it out to the world, which we did begin doing um, right back then. And when I sort of take a stand back from it, like I feel like uh, we're experiencing now in this real convergent moment around podcasting, essentially the third wave. This is like the third attempt, which I believe is going to stick. So I actually, I'm not, I'm not as worried as Benjamin might be, um, although some of it is hype. Uh, that first wave was the uh, origin moment, you know, 2003, 2004, 2005. Um, and interestingly, so even though it was called podcasting, which is a word I think collectively we all really don't like but are stuck with permanently, the pod itself is no longer even part of the apparatus. Um, and you might as well, for most people, the, the phrase subscribe to podcast might as well be install Ethernet card. Like, it makes no sense. Like, um, but uh, essentially in 2005, Apple uh, woke up to something that they hadn't invented, and they like, incorporated it into iTunes. And I was remembering this because it was just 10 years ago, that summer of 2005, um, that Odeo, which was the first kind of interesting startup in the space around podcasting, was like creating this really beautiful way to publish and discover podcasts. Um, and we were visiting them trying to you know, do a deal with PRX and Odeo. And Apple had stepped in. And essentially, at that moment, um, the way we describe it is they, they licked the cookie. <laughs> they like touched podcasting, but then never really invested in it. And everybody else kind of just stood away from it. And Odeo collapsed. And then this sort of incipient wave that like had begun um, kind of flatlined for a while. And this sort of moment where we had all these pod camps and podcast consulting um, just sort of petered out. The second wave. Um, was also sort of accidentally um, triggered by Apple, and that was the iPhone. The so smartphones, 2008, the App Store launched, and this like new wave, like, those of us in audio and radio finally sort of said, oh my god, these are radios. These are not just smartphones, these are radios, and they're going to be in everybody's pocket. And it could finally fix the thing, which is that audio has just been a bad fit for the web. I mean, everybody remembers like the terrible like real players and quick time players, and like audio is just never a good fit for the web, and mobile was suddenly going to solve that. And so there's this rush to say, you know, podcasting has a second chance. And that's when Stitcher started, like right around that era of sort of a second wave. And it's just taken this long um, for that all to actually be true. So mobile is the driver for that, and it has become a way for these billions of devices that become a listening uh, platform for audio. Um, and this, about 18 months ago, started to converge where the trend of mobile adoption, um, the interest of all these advertisers and the big trucks of money that Ben seems to know where they are, and like, I would like to know where they are too, um, started pulling up because you know advertising and audio is actually a good fit for mobile, which is otherwise like a painful kind of thing for display ads. Um, and then talent, which I think is really the secret of it all, um, which is great storytellers and, and sort of adjacent creative fields now recognizing that while podcasting was always possible, now it's also viable. Um, and we're starting to see this influx of some really terrific stuff with public radio, the tradition of like really great, excellent, high quality, story driven, rich production um, has led the way. Um, but that is not necessarily a, a, a position that will retain as this really transforms who's in the game. Carrie, maybe try yeah. to talk a little bit about oh, yeah. oh, this distribution platform topic. Yep. Sure. Thank you. Um, I am Ben Walker's driver of the money truck. <laughs> 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 we got a lot of work to do on that. Um, but the, you know, the thing that uh, this summer I was on a podcast panel and they sent us around a question that said, you know, finish this sentence. You know, the the future of audio storytelling is. And so I sent back the answer now. It just is now. And this is, this is kind of what, for, for PRX, we've certainly been doing this for a while. We find ourselves at this interesting nexus of, uh, of many great things, of both the uh, great storytelling, great talent, and the technology to be able to enable it all to reach the people that we hope. And way back in 2003, we had a tagline that we used. There's, you know, PRX, you know, uh, making public radio more public. And while we can drop the public radio part, like this piece of making everything public, I, re I really agree with what 
you said, which is like this moment of having direct to consumer consumption of um, media and stories and news and investigations, et cetera, is really a fabulous thing that the podcasts have all enabled. And we call them shows when we are not in rooms like this. Um, in 2014, we uh, launched Radiotopia, and the idea behind Radiotopia was to take, to, to build that platform for talent, people like Ben. We now have 13 shows, and when we started, the idea was to um, consolidate some of the back office things of marketing and monetization, um, et cetera, and, you know, bandy together and cross-promote. And when we started in January of 2014, we had just under a million downloads, and we've been able to increase that by tenfold inside of two years. Inside of two years, <laughs> about 18 months. So, like, that kind of growth tells us a lot of things. It tells us a lot of things about the public's interest in consuming this kind of content. It tells us a lot about the sort of ubiquity of the technology that they are using to get it. And it tells us that, like, we've been able to make these shows survive because for a long time, podcasts would get to a certain size and sort of pitter out and not be able to break through with enough finances to continue to and even out their production schedules. So th like, this is a really exciting time for what comes next. And I'm you know, happy to hear what you have to say about the next wave. <laughs> Well, Chris, maybe talk about that a little bit, about sort of the next wave. I've heard sort of two origin stories in there. One, the rich tradition of public radio, narrative storytelling, all of that. And then I love the reference to sort of blogging, this democratized ability of everybody to grab hold of the media and post their own thing. Um, it does feel like as a medium, as a creative medium, it's, it remains very much modeled on public radio broadcast. Is that right? Is that sticking? Is that going to continue? Um. Chris, I can only say that that is not my start. Mm -hmm. uh, for me, again, going back to Iraq, when we were hatching the podcast, uh, the war in Iraq was heading into its first of many, you know, uh, gutters. Um, and 70% of the people in this country thought Saddam Hussein had been behind 9-11. We knew then, we know absolutely now, it was a complete... Uh, wrong statement. I mean, it was propaganda. It was bullshit, for lack of a better term. It was, we were being used, we were being, we were being stampeded into incredible, historic folly. That, to me, is the problem. And, you know, I, I wrote at the time, if the New York Times, the New York Times should have done banner headlines saying, it is not about Saddam Hussein. 9-11 was not about, and, until people flushed out the truth and, and came to understand what we were doing. I mean, I, I, it sounds like such an old scold, but you know, I, I go by Tony Jutt's line. You know, we have big problems in this country. Money worship is one. Um, uh, uh, the, 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 the erosion of a social democracy is another big one, and a dilapidated public conversation is the third, and it makes the others possible. We're not talking about real stuff in this country, even now. And, and with all due respect to the heroic entertainer Donald Trump, you know, we're not getting it out of this political campaign. And I, I get sort of frantic thinking, who's going to speak for the people? And I think the people, part of the reason they're disgusted, as Tony Judd said, there's no place to have a reasonable kitchen table conversation about real stuff. And I think it's behind the Tea Party. I think it's behind Occupy. There's this immense vacuum of reality conversation in, in, in us, among us, the reality community, OK? so. Uh, where's it going? Yeah. Uh, but podcasts. Where's Chris? the podcast going? Okay. <laughs> Where am I going? I don't no, know. No, the farm. No, no, no. I, 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 I think this does tie in. But well, well, one of the things about the podcast, let's remember, it's, it's public radio or not, it's the voice. It's the human voice. Studs Terkel called it Vox Humana, that fabulous instrument. Why do we love radio? Why do we love podcasts? Because you hear a human voice in all its incredible variety and contradiction and accidental revelation, blah, blah, blah. So the question is how to enliven the human voice in a conversation that matters, that's interesting, can be entertaining, can be poetic, musical, whatever, but that but bears on reality. So I, I just say two things about the future. As I say, uh, the, the commercial thing is fascinating. I'm glad you, you've got an army truck, Ben. Um, I don't have a big one, but <laughs> they're, they're here. Oh, and <laughs> you deserve it. You deserve it. There's no question about that. At the same time, you know, this country can make money on shit 
without trying. That's what we do. <laughs> That's what we do. And so, big deal. Yeah. Uh, we did it with broadcasting. The Brits, you know, got the BBC. We got commercial broadcasting. And it's a bit of a problem, but it's a reflex. And it does not address anything that I'm interested in. Uh, the other side of it is, I think, the problem that I'm really fascinated by, including PRX's great efforts, is how do we aggregate great voices? I mean, I never stopped podcasting, even, you know, even yeah, a yeah. week <laughs> through, the, through the downtime. But I, I was always looking for, you know, Tim Leary said, find the others. Find other people, not necessarily that agree with me, but from different countries, different cultures, different angles, but that would begin to amass the, what became very phony authority of the New York Times. I mean, sort of all the, all the news, all the ideas, we think of as the original, all things considered, Stamberg glory days. But I, I mean, think it, with it, podcasting right now, we're getting that, that plethora of voices. I really do. I think that's what, well, you know. Plethora, we have, no question. And, and for intelligent searcher, it's an unbelievable time to want information. You can get it. You can hear voices. But to get, to find the others, to aggregate them without smothering each other, that to me is the riddle ahead. I mean, I, 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 coming back to your question there, I just want to jump in on that. I feel that, uh, for, I just want to say that I'm not worried about the future because Jake's not worried. I mean, really, like, I, I, I'm not. <laughs> Jake's worried. not worried about anything. I just, when, when, I, when I see that, so I, I just want to make I that clear. <laughs> but, um, I, you know, thinking about the, the waves, uh, you know, the way you, you see it in terms of years, I've always seen it more, the kind of almost like a Rashomon narrative where they're all happening at the same time. So you have, Podcasting is a story about technology that starts with Dave Weiner and Chris here at the Berkman Center with you know RSS MP3 enclosures. Then you have the business model money story, which really doesn't take off until Roman hijacks the uh, public radio business model in 2011 with his Kickstarter. And then you have the art form story, and to me, that's the only one that's interesting. I think the technology boring. Money's boring. <laughs> the art form one is actually the one that is so exciting right, right. now. And to your question about you know, uh, public radio and, and the other types of shows out there, I feel that because Serial was connected to a public radio institution, that's why we're still focused on, on, on the connections to radio. But that, was, that is a thread that doesn't really exist. I feel something really interesting. In 2004, Dave Weiner and I got in a big fight because he said I wasn't a podcast. I was too good to be a podcast. I was, a, I was radio. I was like, I didn't fit in his definition of podcasting. And this was like the day after he had just aired like his own podcast where he'd left the microphone on and like went to the bathroom <laughs> in the other room. So I was like, all right, you know, we, were, we just had it out. But you know, I was on a panel with... Um, Sarah Canning last year, and she said the same thing. Like, there's no difference between radio and podcasting, which is what I had said back to David then. And I realized that I don't believe that anymore. I actually think that there is something to this actual medium itself, which is different than radio, that you can't use the same tricks. You have to approach it in a certain way. It, it speaks to what you mentioned, Chris, about the voice and about getting people uh, together around conversation and personality and... Uh, I, I think that, you know, I, I feel a podcast that doesn't get enough uh, love is the Welcome to Night Vale podcast, which is not connected to public radio, which has done extremely well, like knocked it out of the park in terms of numbers, in terms of monetization strategy. They do tours, they sell stuff. And, and but yet you see a lot of the media stories about the ones that are connected to the public radio world. And I feel that just as you know, the podcasting stole the business model from public radio or ran with it, that you're going to see that in the future. Like, like that, we don't really have a, uh, an ownership of that moving forward. I think we're going to see an explosion of really so amazing how is, things. How has your show changed? So like you did one in 2004 and now yeah. you're doing one now? What's, what, what's I think I really made it more like a radio show. I felt that uh, one of the things I've noticed this year, especially sort of with the uh, Gimlet with their startup podcast, the idea, you know, I like to just start mine, and you know, you, it's kind of confused. You don't know exactly what's going on. And I felt that worked in the age of radio because as a show's over and the next one comes on, you kind of have to get up to turn the radio off. And I like to always play with that idea, like, oh, I'm going to keep people listening by, you know, by... Disorienting tricks. them. <laughs> yeah, or just like, you know, trying my thing. And I feel that in the podcast world, man, you have to get people to turn you on. And like to do that, they kind of really do need to know what's going on. So there's a, like a more of a tug to like being guided that really didn't exist, I feel, in the, in the old radio way, which is fine. I mean, I think we have a narrative, personality-driven 
tradition that's awesome and we, it can lead to all kinds of great things. But I do, I feel like my eyes have been opened up to the idea that it is different, which is what Dave Weiner had argued to me here at the Berkman Center in 2004 and I didn't believe him. I mean, and, I, uh, I think, yeah. I think that an important point here too is that the, um, the public radio and the, all the stations and all the networks included are centers um, for excellent audio making. So it makes sense that some of the stories that are, that are doing the best on, in podcasting come from all of those excellent institutions. There's also a high overlap of the demographic of public radio listeners and people who own iPhones. And since iTunes and Apple is so dominant in this field, like that's not a mystery. And one of the things that I look forward to in the next wave, and I think it actually will increase the democratization of this, is the Android side, because there are more Android users in the world than iPhone users. And so I think that that's going to really change the um, access and the kinds of conversations that we're going to hear. The signal to noise ratio is still an important reality. It's important for reality for us, even though we have a, we occupy a lot of this um, sort of one percent of these top podcasts in the iTunes store, but the you know the next the next wave is going to see what happens when really there's a, a very different conversation going on with women, people of color, different communities, and you know and, and that Android users have full access in a really different way. I think it's going to really change things. Yeah, I think I mean that's that's one of the great hopes for this is that it both has the potential to transcend its public radio origins, which is public radio's famously kind of been caught in a, in a sort of self-fulfilling format. The dominant franchise has served a particular audience and that's you know, created a, a sound that is you know, successful but not appealing um, to all kinds of people who don't either hear themselves reflected or have a chance to get on the air. So both the sort of gatekeepers of broadcast but also the sounds that are being produced. And it also has a chance to transcend its technology origins. Um, so the early adopters both of like who could figure out how to make a feed and who could figure out how to subscribe to one is, it tends to skew as many internet technologies do to a particular kind of dominant white male techie crowd. And we're starting to see that really transform. And I think that is one of the big opportunities um, ahead of all of us that we're trying to intentionally you know, do things that public radio could never do because of its constraints um, around broadcast, and that's still in the early days. I think there is an interesting facet of the technology story, even though Ben finds, ben, the technology part of the business part is boring for Ben, which is why Carrie and I manage that part, and he does the awesome uh, storytelling. <laughs> but this bit about RSS, so this is like actually RSS 2.0, it's a standard that is like actually, you know, housed at the Berkman Center. Um, and in media, it's one of the last remaining open standards uh, protocols that's actually driving um, a significant media type. So video has been carved off into sort of islands of of you know, access, so YouTube being the dominant one, but you've got their Netflix and others of the world. Um, even blogging has, while still huge, you know, you've got Facebook basically where all publishing happens and you've got Medium now trying to like, create a different sort of island around it. Um, we still have this moment where RSS and podcasting is an open-ended system. Um, and I love the idea that that's still part of its participatory promise and origin story. It's part of what public radio and in its, its theory was always part with the public piece of it. Um, and to Chris's first point, like this is exactly how the, the hope for you know everybody being a blogger is still part of the podcast story. And I'm, I'm worried about, that. If, if I'm going to be worried, it'll be worrying about that, which is sort of what has started to happen in video will happen in podcasting. You'll start to have to go here for Ben's show and there you know, for Roman's show, and that would be a problem. But as it gets more popular and valuable, that tends to be a trend of successful internet companies, which is to fold the, you know, close the doors after everybody's left. But we already have some of that. If you think of like Audible's plan, which is another very successful audio company, I mean, you kind of have to go there to get their shows and... and for books. Yeah. Still. Well, they're, and they're yeah. investing heavily in... Um, I just want to say that when you said institutions, though, I, I, I have to, to, to say that I feel like a lot of that is not the public radio institutions that are making the great podcasting. It's people who left those institutions. And I, I think that's an important distinction. I mean, I was at... Gimlet's one-year anniversary party last a couple of weeks ago in New York, and I counted like 26 people who are now working in podcasts who left public radio, left it because like they could do more and like make more of an impact and do the things that they wanted to do. So I kind of feel that like I'm watching the public radio infrastructure almost trying to like catch up. But they're, they're not even like taking risks at this point. Like I feel like a lot of the risks that were taken on a lot of this content was more on the margins. That's just a, it's a minor point, but I think it's important in the story. 
I think that the risk point is a good one, too. So because of the uh, lessening expenses of creating podcasts and creating an hour-long broadcast show, which is really out of the reach of most people, the, um, the, the piece that will be um, part of the future, too, is there's going to be a lot more experimentation. There's going to be a lot more fails. And, and that's not something that um, public radio is super accustomed to because by the time they launch a broadcast radio show, they've done a million polls, uh, lots of focus group studies, et cetera. And so we are absolutely moving into a much more experimental time frame that is exciting, but also like we're going to have to work through what works and what doesn't. And we're going to have to be very nimble about that in show development. It's still hard to get a show with zero audience to get a big audience. It's, it's still extremely hard. And in podcasting, where it's digital only, it's, uh, you, you really have to be, like, there are, ex, there are um, exceptions, but a network effect of like-minded um, shows or talent is really what's going to give the lift. How, how is, we talked a lot about the trucks full of money that don't actually exist. I think everyone would stipulate to that. But the, certainly we're playing a lot more to advertisers and, and underwriters, I think, than we ever did before. Kerry talked about the birth of podcasts at public radio stations being maybe partly a function of the existence of studios and equipment where you could record things. And now we can all do that on our laptops. But the other thing public radio stations have is sort of a business model and an existing way of supporting their programming. And as we all know now, we are... You, Gary and Jake in particular, spending a lot of time thinking about how to bring advertisers into the story. Does that cut against the kind of experimentation you're talking about, Kerry? Are people going to be less likely to engage in experimentation if they're also worried about bringing in more advertisers? Are we moving more toward a commercial media model where we have to take the commercial advertisers' interests into account? Or anyone, anyone have any thoughts? I, I don't think so. I mean, I think that there are, um, there are, and this, this uh, question is a a little challenging because there's so many different kinds of content and I do think that uh, investigative journalism shows are going to operate very differently than other other shows. Uh, the producers we work with can always say no to advertisers which we um, which we use liberally when when we feel it's appropriate. Um, but the what what advertisers are waking up to is that the uh, listeners of podcasts, to, to Ben's point earlier, they're, they're, they're subscribing, they're selecting, they're choosing, saying I want to listen to this. Um, that's a more intimate experience and it's a, it's a more dedicated fan base that we've been able to um, secure. And so the advertisers are waking up to that reality. There's still a lot of work we all have to do on measurement, et cetera, but, but there, is, there is much more interest. We, we've seen, since we work in both broadcast and podcasting, we've seen a shift in um, broadcast dollars being shifted to podcasting. That's a totally new. That's totally new. That was not the way it used to be even just two or three years ago. And yeah. more is coming, I think, because of the ad blocking story. I get everything that's in the news right now with what's going on with web publishing and ad blockers, I feel that in podcasting, uh, you know, a lot of that excitement that advertisers have too, sort of, you know, jumping on the hype train, I feel like that's going to benefit what we do as well. Um, as a maker, I mean, just this year has been so instructional, but I'm not exactly the biggest fan of advertising. But I will say that, you know, the discovery piece, and that's, a, that's an interesting piece of the technology story, I feel. The, techn the discovery piece is so hard with so many podcasts out there. It blew my mind to, the, to realize that some people will hear an ad at the beginning of a podcast as a sign that, oh, this must be a good podcast. <laughs> and it's, so, I mean, you just, yeah, I mean, my brain just melts when, I, I mean, when yeah. that, that research kind of came my way. I just... Yeah. And the the other Don't pieces. Know how to make sense of that well, anymore. the other pieces of the business model, like some of them are tried and true. You know, we we think of it as a three-legged stool of you know philanthropic dollars and donations and sponsorships. We kind of have to balance everything out. We work hard on all three fronts, um, and so that's the strategy that we take. Some take a membership model. Some use paywalls. There's all kinds of strategies that people are experimenting with. I mean, the one of the exciting things for us, and this I think is borne out in examples like Kickstarter is the power of the micro donation that is a new thing so in, in public radio you're really looking for the uh, sustainer donor the people that will give you sort of an average of hundred dollars over a year and then you ask them for a lot of information and then you have you send them material you know ful fulfillment gifts and you have you're really kind of banking on them to mature with you and what we were learning with with our shows is that 
people just give five dollars or ten dollars because they're inspired in a in a moment to do so and we have to be very careful to not ruin that moment by asking them too many details about themselves just accept it keep building good good shows and good audience and move on to the next and so that the, all of that has really changed for us that's very much against standard fundraising um, just the, picking up on, I mean the advertising story is a fascinating one because it's you know so challenged in the digital space the ad blocking thing is like clearly basically the counter trend to the entire saturation we're experiencing the hope is that we are not going to be reliant on advertising as media and journalism forever because that actually could really skew the entire internet if that becomes the sole source um, and uh, nonetheless, you know, the audio engagement and the sort of CPMs from advertisers has been chasing like wherever they can find some value and that, you know, podcasting is relatively new in that, especially in mobile, which otherwise is like a really painful thing for advertisers to get to. Um, but the inevitable trend for most digital media is that those go down over time as people figure out more efficient ways of selling it and there's more inventory and there's more programmatic ways of fulfilling it. So we're in what I do think is maybe a temporary, maybe several years, hopefully for your sake, to uh, bubble around that. But what's amazing is that the crowdfunding trend has emerged in a way that like, you know, public radio had pioneered 40 years ago and managed to sort of cultivate still without, you know, any data, but has managed to do sort of through brute force um, pledge drives um, for years. And here comes crowdfunding with both Kickstarter and now Patreon and now there's like multiple sort of ones around different communities and constituencies. And we see that as something that could really start to evolve in a different way where the fans of shows or the fans of Ben's show um, not just through a one-time campaign, but for something that's connected, how you talk to them, can support this in a way that isn't just merely about you know, the transaction. And, and on the front side, too, I feel like the Planet Money t-shirt um, thing they did, which you know, funded all of that programming, was, on, you know, like, was basically asking listeners to invest in like, the front and not even reward it. That, to me, was still like, so one of the most exciting things I've seen, in our, and I'm hoping, you know, I think, you know, as Carrie mentions, you know, the three-legged stool, I feel that because of the, you know, the, the advertising sort of money truck thing, we, it's almost like it's, it's been hard to focus on that other stool. You know, like we did our Kickstarter campaign last year, which, can't, which obviously is part of that. But I'm really excited to, to seeing, you know, uh, especially, you know, since I know some about it, like some of the, the more work that we're doing, especially organizations like Radiotopia and, you know, maybe others in the space and in terms of developing that, that leg of the stool. Chris, yeah. I, I, I got a quick question, comment and then a question maybe for Ben especially. Um, but the comment, I mean, I feel always compelled to, to uh, thank Ralph Aldo Emerson for inventing the internet in 1850 or so. But basically, you read Emerson, what is it about? It's about <clears throat> trust thyself, every heart vibrates to that iron string, write it now, don't read it in somebody else, under somebody else's name, change your mind if you must, don't be a conformist. But the whole idea of an expressive democracy is all there in Emerson. He was a, he was a genome guy, one species, way ahead of his time. He was a global guy, student of Indian theology you, and Persian poetry, way ahead of his time. But he believed in conversation. He believed in democratic conversation. It seems to me the internet is just the fulfillment of a vision of a, of a Gabby species that loves all manner of culture, politics, interaction, and, and now we have it for the whole bloody world. That's, that's a short comment. So we have to live up to that gift, I think. That's the mission. <clears throat> but I, we all feel this sort of tide of audience, talent, as Ben says, you know, a lot of the best people are getting out into this promised land and, and uh, money out of public broadcasting into podcast world. And I just want to, uh, all of us to sort of stop for a moment and say, you know, I is this what we want? What are we, what are we losing? And <clears throat> to think hard about it, but also to hold the public broadcasting uh, to account. I mean, I, I, I still think, do the newspapers have to die? They were all wrong on the, on the gigantic issue of, our, of their moment, you know, the war in Iraq, and they never asterisked George Bush. That pissed me off to begin with. As, as, you know, the Roger Maris of our president, selected, not elected, he should have been asterisked, and he should have been held under a close check. Uh, but they weren't, they made, and every single one of them, and the New Yorker, and the Washington Post, and the Boston Globe, they all lemmings into that disaster, and most of them have never said, 
mea culpa, mea culpa. And a lot of the worst writers are still writing, telling us about the world. They know nothing about the world. So people left the newspapers for good reason. If the newspapers had another chance, could they save themselves? Could they, could they rebuild their credibility? Could public radio institutions, Ben, make it more interesting, make it more welcoming to talents like yours, and make it more true, make it feel like podcast world? Is it too late to say, we had something brilliant there. It works like crazy. It's, you know, Save it. I don't work in public media. And, uh, <laughs> well, I do halfway. I, well, it, I just, it's just not my problem. I feel like if they really... You're a citizen, have, man. Come they, on. No, no. They have a lot of money for their board meetings. They have nice offices. They can figure this out on their own time. I'm not... The way the newspapers them. did, yeah. All I know is that it's just not my problem. And maybe they could fix it out, but like rock out. Like, I'm just going to... I'm, I, I think it's much more interesting to talk about where all those people who left are going rather than can, like, the people who are left, where are the managers and the office people that are just, like, good luck. So we have a, we have a, little, more, we have a little more sympathy um, <laughs> than, than Benjamin does. Um, and, you know, we, PRX really was born out of public radio institutions in a lot of ways, but designed to help bridge this gap to something brand new. So we don't have a tower. Um, we're not, you know, run by NPR. We're independent um, and based on the web and built digital from the get-go, um, but have seen and, and feel and respect a huge amount of institutional value um, that we continue to actually be part of. So we continue to distribute broadcast shows. The Moth is on over 500 public radio stations, and the reach of those stations and the power of that broadcast has helped them create events and communities and slams and storytelling hours that are now you know, a huge part of actually how people are connecting around storytelling. And the best of those stations um, have embraced their role as civic institutions and not just sort of simple pass-through of audio programs. Um, and some of them, um, in particular, are trying uh, to you know, jump into this fray in a way that I think will have a positive role. And when we talk about, in podcasting in particular, for them, um, there's a couple of opportunities. Uh, one is um, some of them really can be incubators for the next generation of this. There are talented people in their walls um, who are not getting a shot at the mic and could. Um, Radio Lab famously started as like a Sunday night show in the off hours of WNYC um, and turned into something phenomenal that has like transcended both broadcast and podcast. So there are also people, there's just as it was starting and their podcast started out of the gate. And then there are also people in their communities that if they wanted to invite in because they do have some of that same thing that Radiotopia offers which is sort of a platform and a back office and some sort of ways to help them with skills, um, that would be a good role as another kind of you know, lift. And then I think their opportunity to Chris's point is to change their air. Um, and to reflect something that's happening that's wildly different than what the sort of stable of programs that we've heard for decades on public radio are. Um, and now's the opportunity to do that role, which is they've been a curator and a connector of great stuff for their audiences, much, many of whom still are not yet hip to you know, downloading the right app and connecting around this kind of stuff. Um, and it would be a great role, as some of them are starting to do, to say, hey, there's incredible, diverse, new, interesting things, and you should hear about it, and we'll help you find it. You know, when you say it could be an incubator, I mean, that's like, yes, anything is possible. But I mean, I, I just want to say, like, from the point of view of, like, a young 20-something pr producer, Where who are so many of them right now so excited about, like, becoming, like, the next Roman, they think, you know, they see Kickstarter dollars, as Carrie famously said, and think that's all they need to, to, to make a show when it actually takes a lot more investment and a lot more time and a lot more strategy, which is true. But that said, I don't think any of the young producers I know, especially living in New York, in which there are so many of them, and then you know, the ones we interact with, they're inspired by people like you with, like, Radiotopia and organizations sort of on the margins, but like no one is looking at a radio station as a way. Well, that, that WNYC podcast accelerator had a huge number of applicants because they are excited about the lift, the visibility, the talent they have. I mean, for sure, like we think Radiotopia and sort of breaking out of all of those institutional constraints is like, that's our bet. Like we are doing that. Uh, but I think there's no reason not to try to lift and pull the parts of this industry that has such tremendous reach and value and tradition into this world. And we're not giving up on them, but we're not waiting for them to get it. Yeah, yeah no, I, I, I'm just saying from the point of view of the producer type, I yes. feel that they see, they're, they see more opportunity for sure. in this explosion of podcasting than the other model. I agree. I mean, I guess I just want to add, I just want to, add to this because I feel so, I, I so agree with what Chris is saying. And I, uh, my answer is I, I hope so because public broadcasting, uh, like if it, it is very harmful to us to live in a society where the, all of the media outlets that reach the biggest audience are owned by a, such a, f you know, a small number of corporations. And so let's hope so. Let's hope they actually 
make better news, make better shows, like stop being so vanilla ice cream sometimes. And uh, like, it's just, it's an imperative now that doesn't, and sometimes when things like podcasting come around where advertising dollars start shifting around, that is actually a good disruptive moment because it's a reminder to public broadcasting who's losing talent, losing some advertising dollars to say, okay, wait, we have a mission and we have to fulfill it because we have to provide for ourselves to continue to do this because it's so imperative to a civil democracy for us to have a good public broadcasting system. That's a great moment, maybe. We probably have 20-ish minutes left to segue out to you all. If the word podcast is dated, then the reference to playing Phil Donahue when you have a wireless mic maybe <laughs> dated as well, I have to say that. So we've got a couple of them in the room. If anyone wants to dive in and ask some questions, let's go. We'll start right up here. And introduce yourself. All right. Introduce, you got to only get 999 questions. Say, say again. Introduce yourself, too. Oh, hi. I'm Karen. I, uh, help young, I help parents of young children worry more and enjoy less with my podcast, We Turned Out OK. And I That's a great I just name. Have a, <laughs> I have a thousand questions, but I'm going to ask one. Um, so I am a podcaster because I have, well, I came on this path because I have a disorder which um, I can't use my hands and my arms as well as most people. And I used to be a, like a quilter, and then I was a knitter. And getting to your point, I, this is an art for me. I mean, it's not, you know, it's not like, a, like painting or something like that. But it's using my voice to help people and tell stories and hear stories is the best thing ever. Yeah. And so my question is, how do I make that not go away? Like, my, what, what lessons do you guys have from this sort of, like, downtime in podcasting, this scary time? And how do I... What do I do like next week and as I'm planning to keep podcasting? Because it's so important. It's so important. So that's my question. Thanks. I would turn to these two in the middle. Uh, the craft. Oh, the, I thought you were talking about uh, the craft. Um, I thought our question was more about how does she make it through the downtime. So, I mean, one of the things, when we were first starting Radiotopia, we would cite a couple influential sort of ideas. Um, one was the whole idea of being a platform for talent, so finding the best talent. But the other one was Kevin Kelly's article about a thousand true fans. Um, and that part of this uh, recalibration is that to be successful, you don't need to reach 100,000 people and sell ads to make sure that you're sustainable, but that part of the joy of the internet is having um, the match between artists and audiences that are you know, far more fragmented and that the thousand people who love what you do might find a way to support it. Um, and then what's been actually surprisingly missing from podcasting, given that it's a digital medium, is that we actually don't know much about who's listening. And um, we should know more. And as the uh, next set of investments in these platforms, and now that you know, Spotify has podcasting in it and knows everything about what you're listening to, the hope is that some of that becomes feedback that you can use and that you would actually be able to appeal to your listeners. Um, and perhaps it's a small crowdfunding campaign, or perhaps it's a subscription to your newsletter. But those are the things that I think at the, in the long tail of this like, growing world of podcasting can help sustain things that are really good but are designed for a small audience. Other thoughts on that from the maker side, maybe? Um, yeah, I think that, that what, what we've done with Radiotopia, which is sort of aggregate a few you know, shows, like-minded souls together, we've seen a few other podcasting collectives pop up. I mean, it seems that in the niche that you're interested in, there are a lot of podcasts popping, like parenting or, you know, like it seems that, that there's maybe, yeah, look for, as Chris even said, find the others and, and, and band together. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, why, why not? Sure. Yeah. But I would just say keep doing it. You, your spirit is so beautiful. You got the idea. You do it with passion. Just keep doing it. My life has completely changed since Good. Tell people. I mean, if you told your listeners just that, you'll find ones that love you to death. Across the room there, yep. Hey, um, my name is Mary Dew. I'm actually a producer of both a radio show and a podcast at WGBH. Um, you guys touched on this a little bit, but I'm curious to think about what you think about the uh, white noise issue. That being, every time you look in iTunes, there's 100 new podcasts every week. And I find that a lot of my friends who are discovering new podcasts basically look at the top 10 in iTunes. Um, and you touched on this a little bit with, you know, iTunes might not be the player anymore, but if you're not, you know, getting featured on This American Life or in the top 10, is it really possible for a lot of people to break through as more and more and more podcasts start getting made? Um, yes, it is. And uh, 
touching on what Jake just said, uh, uh, you know, you have to find your your community and your niche audience. You look for those echo opportunities too. So, like you, I don't know what type of show you're you're doing necessarily, but um, you know, finding people who can guest on your show or whatever, like the, just that echo effect of their audience. We, there's a, a podcast called Longest Shortest Time. It's a parenting podcast. And she found um, a huge community by creating uh, Facebook groups around the country. And then they started to be created without her. So she had started started a you know real movement like, like that. But just a, a marker here, the in like Lipson, which is a popular podcast host, um, they have been public that only 1% of the podcasts that they host have greater than 50,000 downloads an episode. So just, so just to put some reality around that, $50,000, excuse me, 50,000 um, downloads per episode is about where you can start to monetize a podcast. Um, not exclusively if you have a niche, but it's around that. So only 1% exceed that. So there is a lot of noise out there. That is absolutely true. And finding that way is partly through networks, partly through really creative um, marketing. You know, podcasters today, and this is true for Ben too, I mean, they have to be fundraisers, they have to be marketers, they have to be good producers, they have to be audio engineers, and they have to be pretty good hosts. So it's like there's a full stack of skills that, that are happening. And I think that the other piece is making sure that um, if your goal is, like, the goal should always be audience first. Money will come when the audience comes. Audience is the currency that propels the revenue. So just keep, keep on that and, every, and keep them and take good care of them and always have a newsletter. Um, we, and always use very good metadata. This is an often missed opportunity for podcasters that are putting their stuff up because if people hear something, you know, most podcasts are recommended by a friend. Maybe people listen to they can only retain so much, but they're only going to retain one thing about your show, and if it isn't one of your keywords, um, by the time they get back to their, you know, desktop computer to check Google, you know, you've lost that. You've lost that opportunity. So th this is one of the most commonly sort of observed broken bits of podcasting, which is discovery, and um, and it's true that um, other than word of mouth and a few recommendations and cross promotion like in networks, um, that has actually lagged behind the growth. But we're starting to see a lot more you know, interesting innovation investments in that. We're seeing these like uh, email newsletters that are just like the weekly. Here's the like review of the best podcasts. Um, there's going to soon be a podcast about podcasts that's coming out pretty soon. Um, that's going to try to do the same thing. Um, Apple's trying to do a better job. Although Apple again is like surprisingly small team who's managing this entire thing. And someone was asking me like, what's their way of doing all the marketing and recommendations for podcasts? And I said, it's it's Steve. And it's, it is, it's just one guy, it's Steve, and he has an astonishing amount of things that he listens to and promotes, but it's really just Steve. Um, and so I think there's gonna be like, part, you know, I think this is what's gonna, if you watch this space, like the discovery piece and how that sort of weaves into how things are shared and social will be part of the most advanced innovation in, in this next year. Just to add to that, the, I mean, most people are learning about podcasts for, through a friend. They just are. So all of the, that's why the social media is so powerful. But remember to promote your episodes, not, your, not only your podcast, because the episodes are really what people will remember and be attracted to. It's, you have to give them the gateways. Yes. Thank you. Uh, my name is Laurel, and I'm the uh, Dean of a School of Communication at an institution of higher education in the Boston area. <laughs> and <laughs> and uh, we have a digital journalism program, and I've watched over the years our numbers drop to the point where I'm concerned that the upper level administration is going to be considering getting rid of our digital journalism program, which I think is very sad. And one of the things that I've been talking about and thinking about is podcasting as a profession, as a, a profession under the umbrella of journalism. And I've started to try to promote our program, and we do have classes in podcasting. We've had them for a number of years. And I'm wondering if you think this is realistic and if perhaps, because I know I'm not alone in terms of the dropping numbers of new students entering the profession of journalism. Is it realistic, do you think, to promote podcasting as a way for the, under the journalism profession? Anybody? Uh, Would you apply? Uh, I mean, I I'm actually teaching a podcasting class in the <laughs> in a journalism school. program at in New York for a semester as part of a journalism and design at the school. 
program. Um, and all there's 15 students, and yeah, they, they all see, you know, similar to why I was kind of pushing back with, with Jake talking about the public radio stations. Is, yeah, their goal is all, all of them, they want to be, like, they want to be Roman Mars. <laughs> they, none of them want to go work at a radio station. They all want to, like, create their own podcast. So I, I think so, absolutely. I mean, it, it is important to be able to tell the, anybody who's going to put in um, you know, resources to get an education, they do, you do have to tell that other side of the story of where, where do you go with that. And I, and I just think, while, I, while I, my first answer when I heard your question was, yes, it's good. You, sh you should focus on that. It is almost a little bit of an overemphasis on the technology, the journalism, part is still the most important part. The content is still the most valuable valuable part. And the network effect is one thing, but and the technology enables it. So the, you know, you, you have to, I don't, I don't know that the word podcasting is gonna increase the traffic for students necessarily. There still has to be a promising job market outside of any investment in education. But, but I do think that the, you have to figure out a way to describe that that's very multi-platform because that's the reality that we're working in. That's any anybody who's studying journalism, they've got to be adept at all of these all of these different platforms. So. I think it's it is a, is a good time to start creating those classes. Ben's teaching them. Transom Workshop is doing a great job of it. Um, Air um, is doing it. Third Coast is doing it. Center for Documentary Studies. There are these pathways in and a, a, a clear surge of like interest in it. Um, and still, of course, the worry, and this would be for any professional program, that there's not enough jobs on the other side of that, which is still true, um, although this sector is growing. And so now is a good time to begin facilitating that. It's steadily growing at 20% a year. So you're welcome. We pass right over here and then across the room. Hi, my name's Anton. I'm an emergency physician and emergency medicine educator and podcaster from Toronto. Um, and I've got a podcast that I've been going for about five years with about two million downloads. What's it called? Um, it's called Emergency Medicine Cases. Um, my question is, we, we haven't really touched on education, and I was wondering what you thought the role of podcasting in education in general was for the future. Anyone? Chris? Chris, you want to? Uh, no. <laughs> Anybody? Yeah. You mean podcasting to educate people or in an organized way or in schools and whatnot? Yeah, as a way of educating. I mean, much, yeah, I would just say like much like journalism. I mean, it's, it, it, as, a, as a pathway or as a particular mode or, or format, um, it's a good one. So, you know, given that it's uh, designed for information and storytelling and retention and basically people said like audio uh, delivered through voice actually is a very good way to be learning and teaching and there's like tons of apps and stories that are working on that not necessarily in podcasting um, you know iTunes has the entire education you know iTunes U side of it which is audio lectures there's like an equivalent of like the Khan Academy video stuff that's in audio form um, I feel like it's a natural uh, segue from that format to an educational use. I don't know if there's any particular about like how you'd format for an educational purpose. Part of the trick with podcasting is that it has this sort of designed in kind of rhythm to a regularity, like you have to publish a series or make it something where you build an audience around a subscription base. And that's actually been kind of a hindrance. So it might be that you have an awesome one-time lecture and like you don't want to create a whole show out of it. Um, and so that's actually one of the kind of gaps in the interface. Hi, my name is uh, Charlie Warren. I'm a producer of public radio programs, have been for the last six or seven years after a full career in, in commercial broadcast. <laughs> <laughs> what, what I'm getting, uh, the basis between the, the difference between uh, podcasts and, uh, and radio basically seems to be individual versus group. In other words, one individual creating a digital means of broadcast, is that the term? But, and then uh, the other being the radio stations having not only broadcast now, but the digital medium also. Is that uh, a little bit too simplified to think of it as one is created by an individual, the other as a group operation? Yeah, yes. I, I, you know, <laughs> it's also just because, you know, the invest, like Radiotopia started with a lot of shows that were already in progress, that had already been created. I think that now, I mean, you're seeing some of these podcasting operations looking at investing in creating new shows that will have staffs, that will have more than one individual. So I think it's just that 
It just that it, the industry was, it was the beginning of something. But as we move forward, I think you're going to see some pretty intense, uh, bigger than an individual podcast coming along. And if, if, if someone's doing a podcast on an individual basis, it, it seems like most of them start from this, this aspect. If one were to play a Whitney Houston record from 1991 or something like that, um, isn't there a licensing problem here? Who's going to chant? Who's going to yes. take care of the <laughs> that's PR? That's PR that's we have to have an expert, music. expert moderator who um, right. can answer that question. No, I mean it's an interesting conversation we've all been having about sort of the very different music licensing landscape when you're wrapping things up in a podcast and offering it for download than if you're putting it out over the air and we could have a whole uh, day long session as we may ultimately do on that exact issue. More? Other thoughts here? Hi, my name is Mabel Chan. I also have a long history of producing uh, for Network News, actually, and trying to uh, develop a podcast right now. Um, just following up on the distinction between podcasting and radio show, um, would you be willing to share your experiences? Uh, what have you been right about and wrong about in terms of characteristics that sell? You know, you talked about narrative uh, personality and different voices. I mean, have you been right about, you know, if you sound really edgy, if you sound really fast, or uh, characteristics that you think actually can work, but it actually didn't work, or that you, you, you were wrong that this kind of voice will not work, and it, it does. So I'm looking for examples and so, sort of essential elements of what make uh, a podcast work, and that is not what you find in radio now. I can, I can start with um, I'm not a, I'm not a producer, say. Um, but the but I but I have some observations on this because the and this is tied to Charlie's question about so the, the so the broadcast objective is to sort of create the buzz like you're reaching one to many and you're creating a buzz and conversation, and the podcast audience is is what is kind of can only be um, considered like together but alone. And so you are still trying to create a buzz, but people are experiencing you very, very much alone. And often when they're doing other things, um, you're right in their earbuds. So that gives you a narrative opportunity to, to be very different than you would on broadcast. And so we have two shows in our network um, that came from the years of public radio. Um, radio Diaries and the Kitchen Sisters um, have a podcast called Fugitive Waves. So they're award-winning producers. Everything they do is beautiful. They are, they're sophisticated. The sound engineering is really incredible. And the switch to podcasting has been very challenging for them. They never put themselves in anything they've produced up until now. Their own voices. They, they, we're always telling the stories of the world and others. And they're struggling a little bit with how to put themselves. What do they do? Just like put themselves at the top and maybe in the credits, or do they weave themselves through? This is, a, this is definitely a very interesting t uh, skill set shift that we've seen. And, and the people that are native to podcasting, the um, younger folks that are just like start out doing this, this they, don't even, they don't even pause on this. And there's some, uh, they, don't have, they don't have trouble talking about themselves in this way either. So it, it, that is, it's a real tension. And I would just recommend like listening to a couple of podca podcasts that are different, so that you can pick up on like what they might do well and what what they don't, uh, what, or not what they don't do well, but sort of how they're how they're a little bit different. So in our network, like uh, two examples would be well, Ben's show, of course, is one. Um, it's all Ben the whole show. It's Ben's thoughts. It's Ben's opinions. It's I have it's, other people. Yeah, but, yeah, but, no, I'm not. No, he's he's reporting. Don't get me wrong. But it's it's absolutely his perspective. And then if you listen to Radio Diaries or Kitchen Sisters, you can really see the difference in how they might think about that. So hopefully that's helpful. I think one that I I would just notice that might be helpful to you to think about is I think the archive thing is something a lot of folks might be wrong about. The idea is that when you can have everything on, on the back end that you find a show you like, you hear an episode, you're going to go back and listen to all of that right away. I think it's kind of wrong. Like I continually have had emails from some listeners who discovered the show and they'll write me every week and like I'm assuming that they like the show this much, they must have gone back and, 
and her, so the question of repeats, what do you do, which is different in radio, you know, are you really going to put another one in your feed, considering it's still right there, as an archive? I will get emails from the same listeners saying, oh my god, this is my new favorite episode. I'm like, so that means you never went back and heard that one before, <laughs> which I found surprising. And I don't, I mean, I, there's still research going into this question about, it. what do you think, right. Jake? Is it, That's a real research are the, question, too. Are the, is the archives, are people, are the super fans going back and, and hearing those? The super fans are, and I think part of what's right, interesting about the new, fans. you have fake super fans, Ben. <clears throat> I am. I go back and listen to all of them, and I skip. There was another question over there. Yeah, well, I think we have time for one last question right in the back there, and then we'll wrap it up. And he had, he had his hand up, too. Oh, oh. well. Whatever. Um, my name is Lana. I am not in any way affiliated with making podcasts, <laughs> nor, and, but I definitely enjoy listening to them. Um, I am a communication researcher and educator, which means I think about things like the public sphere and the social role or the democratic role of communication technologies to shape public discourse and that kind of thing. Um, and I think that, well, some of the research from my field has shown that uh, one of the functions of media is to make people feel integrated into their local communities and to understand the issues and be invested in them at play, and also to do the same to shape like global scale making to allow us to have global kinds of imaginations. And one of the things that um, the present leading podcasts kind of do is not really focus on community concerns or on global kind of journalism type things, but to kind of uh, create a translocal community the, of people who could be living in Brooklyn or could be looking, living in Silver Lake or Cambridge who are all listening to the same things and talking about them, but not necessarily integrating them with other people who live in the same community as them. Um, so while it may not be Ben's business to think about like, um, you know, the future of public radio, I do think it's all of our business to think about like what kinds of deliberative democracy material we are producing and whether we think that's an important function or not and whether or not there is a vision for creating more kind of just journalism type things that are focused more on local issues or on the kind of like global international politics type stuff. Um. I have a couple of thoughts, so I'll say. Um, so as more and more public radio stations get into podcasting, I think we will see more local um, content coming out. And so this all gets back to uh, the goals. So some of our shows, their goal is to become um, independent from a public radio station so that they can and have enough resources to be able to produce. Um, those 99% podcasts that are not in the 1% uh, of, a lot of those are actually marketers and people who are using podcasts for a different goal. It's not to, not to make money, it's to extend a, a, a message and branding of a different business, like a real estate business or something like that. There's still an enormous amount, most of the podcasts are doing that. So therefore, I think that we will see more and more um, niche local pieces of content coming up that are audio based because they're, they're not designed to you know, make a lot of money, they're designed to extend a message. And that I think we're gonna see a lot of. I think that the, the tools are there, the educational institutions like we were just talking about are there, the training is there, and I just think it's a matter of time. So, I mean, I think um, it is one of those questions about that public radio feels like it has tried to create a town square and some sort of a civic space, um, which it sort of prides itself on, but also has come up short in, in many ways. Um, podcasting is not seemingly solving that yet. The local piece is a challenging one for any digital media business model, and that's one of the reasons why it hasn't succeeded or really been attempted in podcasting. Um, we see shows like Reveal and other ones that, that are taking root that do a, sort of attack sort of a genre or a topic or a journalism sphere um, that can be actually done better in podcasting than public radio could do because it draws on talent from all of those kind of quadrants. Um, I do think there's going to be a role for some sort of institutions and new intermediaries that like actually take that civic role uh, meaningfully, um, and they might not be the ones that we've had in the past. Um, but if this becomes a channel that more people are listening and consuming and participating through, um, that form will, will elevate within it and hopefully shape some of exactly that same thing that's taken root in public radio. I think we'll leave it there. Join me in thanking Christopher Lydon, Carrie Hoffman, Jake Shapiro, and Benjamin Walker. And thanks to all of you for coming. Appreciate it.